So last spring, I was in Syracuse, New York, looking for a baby gift for a friend of mine who was from Nepal. And so I was going to a Nepali market. And I got a little turned around, I couldn't find that market. And so I stopped my car and I rolled down the window. I was stopping because there was a man I thought was from, probably from Nepal. He was wearing a topi hat, which is a colorful Nepali hat. And he was wearing a black vest and black pants and really long pointy shoes. And I thought, I think he's probably from Nepal. So I said, excuse me, where is the Nepali market? And instead of answering me, he jumped in my car. <laughs> so we, off we went to the Nepali market. We ended up spending three hours together, sifting through clothes, deciding what color would be best for the child. And we were looking for the size zero. And the size zero is at the bottom of the bag. These are bags that come from Kathmandu. So you can imagine us digging through the bags and then folding everything back up again. We had to go to all the different markets to find just what we were looking for. And um, after that, we went back to his house and had tea. And by the time I got back in my car, there were 10 of his family members coming over to say goodbye to me. And um, my big idea today is how to um, act like we're traveling when we're at home. So to be more trusting, to be more spontaneous, and to let the world kind of come to us a little bit more. I am a person who loves to travel. I like the landscapes, I like meeting new people, I even sometimes like the airplane. <laughs> and when I am back from one trip, I start thinking about the next trip. Someone sends me a picture from somewhere, I start thinking, ooh, I'd like to go there. One of my favorite places on Earth is Nepal. Kathmandu is just the most amazing place, and when I've been there in the past, I've been there three times, and I just feel really alive there. There are so many sounds. There are um, sounds of the radio, people singing, people drumming, people chanting, bells ringing. It's just the most exciting place for me. Um, my first trip was as a 19-year-old college student. I went for a study abroad there, and this is my, these are my home state sisters. They really taught me so much about what it was like to live in Nepal. They treated me so well, they were so kind to me. And my Nepali never really got very good, but it didn't matter very much because they just took me in, they called me sister. And I, for the first time in my life, I realized that I could communicate perfectly well with someone who I really could only talk about the basics with. Um, so this is Mina and Bina. And we're still actually uh, Facebook friends today. Now this was taken in 1986. And so we stayed in touch or been in touch again. I went back to Nepal another time. I just feel really connected to the place. And um, this was some of the same homestay family that I was in touch with then. When I read in the Observer Dis Dispatch newspaper that there were 400 Nepalis living in Utica, New York, I was so excited, I can't even tell you. But I also didn't really understand it because I was trying to imagine my homestay brothers and sisters on Brinkerhoff Avenue or on Rutgers. I, I just couldn't really quite see how that was possible. Then Tech Munger came into my life and I stopped driving around Utica like a crazy person looking for Nepalis, which is honestly what I was doing. I saw, <laughs> I, I found Vietnamese people, I found Somali Bantu. When I saw Karen, I'd say, oh, okay, they're Karen, but they're not Nepali. Um, so I finally met my first Nepali friends, and he told me a couple things. He said, that article's all wrong. First of all, there are not 400. We're a very small community. At the time, there were only about 250. And we're not Nepali. I said, wait a second, but you speak Nepali, and you kind of look Nepali. What do you mean you're not Nepali? And what he said was, we're actually Bhutanese. We came from the, from the country of Bhutan. Our family moved to Bhutan as workers, maybe 100 years before. And um, this is a picture of Tech's family. You can see his mother here on the right, and then his brothers and sisters, and this is Tech Monger here at the very end um, of this photograph. And it's amazing that this photograph is here today because it was taken around probably 1991 and it had a, a lot of, a long journey to get to where it is today. So this is his house back in Bhutan, and the Bhutanese government is not very nice. They talk a lot about gross national happiness and how what they really care about is the happiness of their people. 
but that they, what they mean by that is the ones who can show that they're authentic Bhutanese. And that, doesn't, that excludes the Nepali refugees from the South. So they expelled 100,000 of them and sent them by gunpoint, basically. They did all the things that people usually do when they expel people. So they burned down villages, and they threatened them, and they arrested them, and they kicked them out. So 100,000 Nepali-speaking people had nowhere to go. Nepal ended up taking them. Um, and here's a picture of a refugee camp today. Nepal accepted them, but only as refugees. And so they built camps. They ended up staying there. And the most shocking thing that Tech Monger said to me is that we were in these Nepali refugee camps for 18 years before we came to the United States. When I, when I get stuck somewhere for 18 minutes that I don't want to be, that really annoys me. And I can't imagine what it would take to stay somewhere for 18 years in a sort of unwelcome guest. You can see the camp is pretty organized. They had a long time to make that happen because they were there for so long. This is a picture of Tech as a high school student. He's really um, focused on culture and music and community. So even though that he was living in that refugee camp, he wanted to keep people's spirits alive, keep their opportunities for education going. And he's always loved to sing. Um, Bhutanese and Nepalis feel very comfortable singing in public. They sing in the taxi. They just sing and sing and sing. And so it's not really a big surprise um, that he's there. He met a, a, a girl named Muna, and she will feature prominently in his story a little bit later on. Tech's time here in the United States was really hard. He's doing pretty well now, um, but in the process of coming over here, he was the first one. His mother didn't want him to come because she was afraid that, that he would be dropped from the airplane and be food for the big fish. That was what they told her. There were a lot of people who were trying not to let the refugees go, but he decided that the only way his family would have a future is if he, went, if he came to the United States. So he was the first one in his family to come, and they sent him to South Dakota, of all places. Um, he went to high school there. He ended up getting a job making computer chips. And from there, he went um, to Salt Lake City. He got another job, and he learned how to be a cable installer. And then he ended up, when it looked like there was an opportunity to have his family reunited, he came back to Utica, and now he is a blackjack dealer. So, um, tech among, so when I asked Tech, how did this all happen? It's hard to imagine someone who was in a refugee camp for all these years being able to kind of adjust to being a blackjack dealer and the situation there. And what he told me was that, when you're in a refugee camp for 18 years and you're not allowed to work, you get really good at cards. So you have to watch out for those Bhutanese Nepali. Um, this is a picture that was taken in his home here. Tech was able to reunite with, reunite with most of his family members. This is his mother giving him a tikka. A tikka is a blessing, and I think of it as a little bit of love. It's made of rice and yogurt and a little bit of sugar and some dye to make it beautiful. And it's when you give someone a tikka, you're telling them that you care about them, that you have good wishes for them. And you literally tell them that as you give them the tikka. Um, so I just really love this picture. I also tell that my Nepali, Bhutanese Nepali friends, I call them that now that I know they're not just Nepali, that they're still the kings of yogurt because this tradition is 700 year old tradition that ne Nepali, have been making yogurt for that long. And then they came to Utica, New York, and now they work at Chobani, and they make yogurt. <laughs> so um, the yogurt features prominently. So these are some of Tech's nieces and nephews, and I think they're uh, pretty thrilled to be here in Utica, too, because really, in the big picture, what matters is having your family together. Um, after I heard some of these stories, partially from Tech, but also from other people, and I see some of them here in this room tonight, I had to share their stories. I could not sleep at night thinking about what the stories and the lives, the lives that they're leading and the way that I just had to share them. So Refugees Starting Over was born. We started out with an exhibit and a um, small scale. We did a film, a puppet show, and a gallery show. But since then, Refugees started, Starting Over has grown quite a bit. This was our team at SUNY Poly. We did an exhibit that featured Facebook photos that were taken um, 
with permission from, from refugees on Facebook. And the idea was that we could look at it from the inside out. We could look at the way that their lives are without always doing portraits from our perspective looking that way. Um, we put together a website, and the website is the start, sort of the jumping off point for other activities that we do, including a film that features Tech and some of his other community members from this community. Here's our um, Facebook page. We weren't really quite sure what to put on it at first, and we weren't sure if it would be popular, but it, it's turned into kind of, we call it an information hub for, by, and about refugees in Utica, New York. Um, <laughs> one of the early activities that we did was participate in the Utica Music and Arts Festival. Tech told me that his family loved to sing and dance, and so I said, why don't you bring them to the festival, and we'll see how that goes. And so he brought half the community, which is really a thrill. These are a lot of the family members, the same people who were in the picture back in Bhutan, and it was a long journey to get here. They sang about Nepal, they sang about the mountains, about their homes back in Bhutan, about nature, and about love. And women danced in the streets, and Ryan Miller figured, was trying to figure out how to make a film about this activity. You can see him there in the background. Everyone had such a good time with this, and I think really felt like this was the first time that the community outside of their own Bhutanese Nepali community was really celebrating their culture. And so um, we decided, we started talking about, hey, maybe we should start a band. And that band became the Bhutanese Nepali Folk Collective. Um, since then, we have performed about once a month around the Utica area at cultural festivals and in schools. I'm the booking agent, and Tech Munger is the general manager of this band. Here we are playing at the Stanley Theater Culture Fest this past year. Our band grew from six people to 35. It's a very collective society, so now we have lots and lots of members, and we've been welcomed by the Munson Museum and Stanley Theater and other places in town, and that really means a lot to them and to me because they haven't been welcomed anywhere in the past, and so to be welcomed means something when you're in that situation. So refugees starting over morphed and changed, and we ended up doing all kinds of activities. People gave me tickets to things. We um, went to ice hockey games. One of the funniest things that I did was take a group of Karen um, teenagers from Burma through the drive through at Dunkin' Donuts. So their job was to, uh, to order donut lemonade. And then they said, excuse me, and they speak Thai, so they were able to ask me, excuse me, I don't know what a donut is, and I don't know what lemonade is. But we went through, and I told the person at the, at the drive-thru that I'd be coming back again, and again, and again, until everybody ordered individually. <laughs> so kids started to ask me to take them places and buy them ice cream, which I was really happy to do. We did some farming together with Old Path Farm in Sequoia. And um, I was able to bring Tech and his cousin Dill to see the One World Peace concert at Syracuse University. And that is a place we heard a speech by one of the most famous refugees alive today, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. In this speech, someone asked the Dalai Lama what he thought the role of music was in world peace. And he had the best answer. He said, I don't much care for music. <laughs> 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 So our group got connected with Foster So and her student group, which is called Americans and Refugee Students for Closer Connection. And we immediately took a lot of people ice skating and to ice hockey games and to the corn maze. And they're really up for anything. People started calling me from other cities and asking me to bring my performers to their city. So we were invited by Ithaca, um, the high school, Ithaca High School and then Cornell University. And we, we thought we were going to bring six to eight Karen dancers. That turned into this. <laughs> it was an overnight trip of 38 people. And um, I think it's just people are so happy to be sharing their culture. Everyone wants a part of it. Throughout all of this, I've been asked to do little things here and there to help out. And I think all the big things are nice, but some of the most important things that I've done are just sitting with people and reading their mail, or giving them a ride to the hospital for a, an appointment. Um, making phone calls for them because the automated phone systems are really, really hard if you're not a, a native speaker of English. 
Some of the refugees that we work with are very tech savvy, they're high school students. Some of them have sent me text messages throughout <laughs> the last year. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm glad you like them. I really like them too. I started saving them. Um, we also, you know, I'm an anthropologist at heart, and so I wanted to document this. I'm also the daughter of two librarians, and they're always telling me, you have to document this. I hope you're taking pictures and taking notes. So we invited some professional photographers to come, and some of the photographs that we've gotten have been really, really outstanding. Um, you might recognize some of the people in this picture. This is Tech Munger's mother and his brothers. And a lot of times in their culture, they don't smile for photographs, but they smile right after the photograph is taken, which makes me laugh. Um, it, you know, I make a fool out of myself sometimes. I make a lot of mistakes. One of them was drinking too much tea. One day I had five cups of chai. Don't do that, I was awake for a week. Um, I learned to talk less and listen a little bit more, I hope. And I've gotten more comfortable with ambiguity. I've gotten a lot more comfortable with the time issues. I think I'm a little bit uptight about some of the time things. One thing that um, I've learned is that if we have a show coming up, that I tell the band if they want to dye their hair, they should dye it the night before and not at the time of the show or the morning of the show. And that's the men that I'm talking about in that particular case. So it's been kind of, you know, I have the job of telling people, hurry up, hurry up. And it's really interesting because in their culture, that's one of the rudest things you can do, is to go to someone's house and say, hurry up. But for us, one of the rudest things is the opposite. We go to someone's house and we expect them to be ready to get in the car. We're leaving, this is my time. So I think that that's been a really valuable thing just for me as a person to learn about the different time orientations. I also have stopped starting sentences with, they need to learn more about our sense of time and starting it with, I need to learn more about their sense of time because I've actually known Nepali people, Asian people now for almost 30 years and I still don't really understand it. So I've got some learning to do. One of the things that was not a mistake in our project was the YouTube channel. Right now, it has had 46,000 views, which means that someone is watching a video on our YouTube channel 60 times a day. So that, that, that seems to be a popular part of the project. I also went to visit a lot of people's homes and they shared their photo albums with me. And I, of course, wanted to document and save those, especially the really precious ones that look like they're getting older. So I started to go to people's homes with a laptop and a scanner. And now that I say that out loud in front of a whole room of people, I sound like I'm completely nuts. But that's what I did with my scanner, scanned people's photo albums, and that turned into snapshots of resettlement, which has been a, kind of an interesting project and way of trying to save some of the things there. So um, I'm gonna leave you with a few thoughts and that is that we are so lucky here in Utica, New York, that we can just walk out the door and we can be in Asia or we can be in Africa, we can be in Eastern Europe. Um, and it, it, I just feel like it's such a special place and I think that you can do that as well. There are so many ways to get involved and get to know refugees. I think there are as many ways to get to know refugees as there are people in this room. And I guess my suggestion would be, you know, there are, you could read people's stories, you could read about the conflicts that brought them here, you could stop by the Midtown Utica Community Center and see what we're doing there, you could volunteer time, um, there are, you could go to an event, there are a lot of different things, and um, I think, I just want you to find the one that's right for you. In the meantime, I'm going to end tonight with, a, with some of my favorite Facebook photos of the refugee community, and here's a song sung by Tech Monger. Thank you.